is the Dish Pig, where we go on a journey of discovery in the food and booze world. I'm your host, Nick Sherry. It's good to be back. Thanks for listening. I'll tell you what, I feel like things are really starting to take a turn in the right direction. Positive vibes. Managed to get myself over to New York for the weekend. So good to be traveling again. Bouncing around the city, a few drinks, a bit of pizza, a bit of duck. Pretty fantastic weekend overall when you think about it. Now, there are only two kinds of people in the world. The Irish and those who wish they were. And that's where we're going this week. We're going to Dublin, Ireland. We're catching up with Alan Mulverhill. Terrific young man who learned his trade uh, in the hotel business in Ireland and now he's the head distiller of an experimental distillery in Dublin called Still Garden. And that's right, we're talking about Ishkabaha, the water of life, Irish whiskey. Now a quick disclaimer, because when I caught up with Alan, he'd had a dram or two of whiskey the night before and mistakenly referred to Peter Bignall as Peter Belgrove. So, Peter, if you're listening, our apologies, good sir, and keep up the good work. Now let's jump into it. Well, Alan, welcome. Thanks, Nick. It's good to be here. Good to to hear you, good to see you, all the way from from Dublin. Yeah, in my wee bunker in Dublin, in Dublin City. How is... I live in, like, centre of the city under a chiropractor at the moment. It's weird. How is your how is your small bunker in Dublin? How are things? Wonderful. It clearly was an Airbnb that had no fucking business, and they were like, "We gotta do something," so they put it up for rent. So it's like <laughs> kind of bougie, but like small. Like everything in Dublin is small. Yeah. Um, the cost of living here is crazy. Yeah, like, the, uh, but it's good. I think the last I'm trying to think the last time I was in Dublin, but I was blown away at just the price of buying a pint of Guinness. <laughs> Yeah, but like you can get stitched up big time. It can be like anywhere between four fifty and eight quid. I think, which yeah, it was, it was high. Yeah, stitch up artists everywhere. Can't can't trust the Irish, right? Or can you? I mean, you got to count your fingers after you shake your hands. <laughs> now tell me, what was um, what was the last thing that you cooked for yourself? Like full full transparency. Uh, the last full, thing I cooked full, for myself. Full transparency. This is literally what I just ate there. I wouldn't even call it cooking. I just grabbed some chips and some fucking hummus and put any sort of sauce that it's into my hungover body. Um, but prior to that, when I actually was somewhat more fucking able, I made myself. Uh, I, I recently learned how to make like tortillas properly. Ah, um, home- homemade tortillas. So homemade tortillas with a little. Uh, they're going to kill me a mess with this, but some like turkey, lean turkey breast. And a little sriracha mayo. Lean turkey. Not very Mexican. Lean turkey breast Sur- on tortillas with, 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 with what? With, did you say with mayo? So, yeah, sriracha mayo. And, sriracha uh, mayo. And then just like some onions and garlic and stuff. I basically had Tex Mex, if that's what you're asking. Yes. Tex Mex, okay. Just, yeah. <laughs> just Only Tex Mex. Brut- brutally honest, it was Tex Mex. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm, yeah. look, there's, 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 there's nothing wrong with putting a little bit of, you know, lean turkey on there just to try and stay healthy. You know, I'm, I'm sure the, I'm sure the Mexicans will, will hate you for it, but you know. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. I have my time there. Well, um, well, yeah. Look, it's, it's good to be chatting to you. I mean, this, this, this conversation really could go anywhere, which is, which is exciting. Um, yeah. But uh, <laughs> yeah. But I wanted to, I wanted to kind of, you know. Focus on Alan himself first. Let's you know t- take it back to oh, okay. take it back to where it all began because you've <laughs> you've you, you, you've you've travelled the world and worked in a lot of bars. But what was it that really kind of kicked things off for you in the in the hospitality business? I mean, you know, growing up in Ireland, what was what was on the horizon for you to begin with? Would, would, was was this something you just stumbled into, or was it always Enough something that you kind of aspired to? Yeah, the the plan. Somewhat ironically, the plan originally was to go into marketing. Um, uh, I was fucking shit house in school, did not care at all, so didn't get the grades that I needed to do that course. Uh, and then 
I went into computer uh, computer science, computer programming at the time, and uh, basically just stood up after my third week and was like, I can't fucking do this. I'm out. Peace. And it's left. Uh, which in, in, in a way is very lucky because I some of my friends that I went to school with did the three or four years and don't do a fucking lick of what they studied either. So I managed <laughs> to gain those those three or four years back for myself. Uh, I went home and I told my parents, oh, I'm going to go take a year out and just find myself. And my mother was like, you're going to find a fucking job. That's what you're going to find. Uh, and I got uh, started in this course run by the government for my culture Ireland, which is like our tourism board. And they were like paying people to come and do a training course. So I went into that while I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Ended up loving it. And then when they got like, if you want to work in hospitality trade in Ireland, there's always jobs. So you just go straight into work. Yeah. And I was working in the, the local hotel um, called the Cargillan Court for what, about three what, years. What, what, what was involved in that in that training course? Oh, like a group of fucking super old school heads who had no love for the job showing you uh, like um, basically how to maintain kegs and uh, make some cocktails, which looking back now, we were not making fucking any decent mixed drinks. <laughs> I'd say I, I did make a decent drink for like six years when I first started, to be perfectly fucking honest. Um, there was a guy who did like silver service because in hotels in Ireland, the weddings and stuff, silver service is still considered like traditional and and quite uh, quite wanted you know people they were in old school uh or an old school country really so people like that idea of being watching the fucking waiter use a fork and a fucking spoon to get fucking <laughs> string beans onto your fucking plate <laughs> fuck it was the worst <laughs> like, these things are not meant to be fucking this is not the why anyway um uh there's that and then there was a very brief introduction into like the running of a kitchen and standard uh, sops and you know how things should be kept yeah, but some of it was very good. Some of it, was. but the people who did it were just like burnt out chefs who didn't want to be working in kitchens anymore. <laughs> so they weren't exactly uh, filling us with uh, wonders on a regular basis. So, so in 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 a, in a way, you could actually say that you're 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 classically trained. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, certainly that's one way to fucking look at it. Yeah, I mean, to a certain extent, yes. Because then when I went and worked in the hotel, it was like a four star hotel and. We were doing silver service weddings, like I said, and you know it was like a the cost. It was one of these places where the customer is always right, but mm-hmm. to the point where it's like the customer is never wrong, no matter what they fucking do. So you just have to like sit there and eat shit constantly. Like, cool, cool. This is this is service. This is hospitality in Ireland. <laughs> um, but the, the reality being that the customer might never be wrong, but they're never fucking correct a lot of the fucking time. Um, is the truth of it, you know? And it was all about like saying no, but can I get you? You never could say, you could never really turn down happy. So it was good experience. You know what I mean? Like, and you learn to deal with people. Mm. You learn to be fucking have patience. And to be honest, I would send like every human into a, into a, into that environment for a year once they leave school because you just have much more respect for others. So this was so you would have been what like nineteen at the time, eighteen, nineteen, eighteen, yeah, eighteen. Yeah, so it's been a lot a while. I'm thirty four now. So that is 16 years working in, holy fuck, 16 years working in the drinks industry. I like, I wouldn't even call it drinks industry. That was six, that was, that was some years working in a hotel and being treated like shit. Um, uh, but I loved it. I'm like, I've met my best friend there. Uh, we're still like best pals. Uh, yeah. Connor O'Keefe, he's getting married in the new year in Edinburgh. He's a distiller in Edinburgh now. Like we've kind of grown up. Quite a few of us who started there are still doing stuff loosely related to the industry at least. So you've all kind of come up, come up in the same class in a way. Yeah, yeah, it's funny that kind of generation of um, thing. It was, it was like the last generation of like where staff had no fucking rights mm-hmm. um, here in Ireland. Do you know what I mean? Like you get called on your day off, but like you need to come into work. And like the idea of saying no was just like, uh, like unfathomable. Just like oh, fine, then never come back in. You're done. You're fired. You're like, okay, <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah, different world now because like staff kind of know the value a bit better mm. which is good so you know so, so so you're working in this in the hotels in in dublin so that's like uh, that was in cork i'm from oh, cork that was, originally that was in cork that was in cork yeah the people's capital when did you you know what um what kind of kept things progressing for you like was it was it was it just a source of, kind <laughs> I, can, of- I, I can re- i can remember the the time the exact moment that I was like, fuck, I need to get better at this. Otherwise I'm going to hate myself forever. Uh-huh. I was traveling New Zealand 
with uh, four of my close pals. And we had just um, gone down to a place called uh, uh, Fox, uh, Fox Glacier in France, Joseph, the two, the two um, fucking glaciers down South Island in New Zealand. Mm-hmm. Those two little towns. Fox Glacier famously with the world's fastest moving glacier of one inch per month. <laughs> it's quick. Bizarre, they were bizarrely proud of. Huge, huge moves from the glacier there. Anyway, we, were, we went to work in that woofing thing where you go and you stay, you work for your, your stay and we're staying in this hotel or hostel and then doing like odd jobs around the town. There's like no police for three hours. There's like 300 people. There's like a couple of bars and some helicopter fucking landing pads. Mm-hmm. Like fuck all happening there. And then farms. And we were helping out in the farms, doing some work for cash in hand, uh, just trying to figure out how we got further south because we wanted to travel and explore. Uh, new ownership came with the hostel and they took over the place and they kicked out all of the staff and then hired us to run the hostel thing on like mega bucks. <laughs> we were like, well, this is fucking fortunate. So we ended up spending like six months in in Fox Guys here. But at the people who were coming in were always like, yeah, you know, if you work hard, you can kind of aspire to be like what, what I do, you know, and come in, look after the hostels. And I was like, this is your fucking dream. You want to like run minging fucking hostels for the rest of your fucking life? It's like, this is not, I thought I liked this. This is fucking a bit depressing. Um, so when we got back to uh, the capital city, well, uh, not Wellington, um, what is the capital? What's Auckland? Auckland. Um, I was working in an Irish bar called Danny Doolin's. Okay. Which is the 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 eminent Irish bar in uh in Auckland. And it's like fucking chaos there every night of the week, fully fucking full to the brim, can't fucking see a cat outside the fucking place. <laughs> and during it was during the Rugby World Cup. So obviously it was like four times as busy as normal, and mm-hmm. it was just a fucking nightmare. They were like feeding us vodka Red Bulls during shift to Oof. keep us like peppy and happy. And they would just say the kettle is on, and it was all Irish people working there. Like, why would you come to a fucking Irish bar in the Auckland? I don't know. But anyway, all Irish. And then the kettle will be on. You go down to the end of the bar, and there'll be like sixteen uh, vodka ripples or Jaeger bombs. Jaeger bombs, sorry. And uh, we would be drinking those, and you drink like ten, fifteen of those a day because uh, you start work at like three o'clock and you go home at like seven a.m. and you eat in that the sounds... McDonald's and you go home. That's that's uh that's brutal. Yes, it was fucking brutal, but it was some of the best times of my life. And then anyway, the moment that I was like. It really hammered home. Some guy came into me and made a load of money. And we were just like squeezing tourists for cash because we wanted to get all the money we could, obviously. And he came in and he was like, you're an Irish guy. Like, what do you know about Irish whiskey? And I was like, oh, uh, I mean, Jameson is pretty popular. And he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone fucking knows that. Like, what else is there? What else do you have here? And I turned around and looked at the back bar and I was like, I don't have a fucking clue what any of these things are. And I thought to myself, okay, well, I'm, I never like being... Because the only guy who doesn't know something in a room, so I was like, fuck this, I'm going to go figure out what, a, what whiskey's about. Yeah. Uh, and I went and did a little research, and then suddenly more and more customers are doing this because tourists always ask questions. And then I started getting sent to the table to, to explain what we had. Tips were fucking good. I was like, okay, I like this. I ended up finding that I really liked it, and, and, and sort of finding a newfound pride in like Irish products because we didn't really talk about, like we have great produce and stuff here. But even back then, the hospitality, like the hospitality industry was trying to copy France or trying to copy what they're doing in Spain. Yeah. No one no one was like, this is uniquely us and we should be proud of it. So I, I found myself really enjoying that and that tied to my culture. Um, and then went to work in other bars off the back of that. Some guy came in and heard me talking about whiskey. He was like, you need to know your stuff. You should come and work in my bar. <laughs> Absolutely poached me from that fucking place. Um, and I went up and then there was a cocktail joint and I was like, oh, cocktails, what's this all about? <laughs> and it was like a proper intense fucking mixology uh, air quotes for those who can't see me. Air quotes. Um, <laughs> a bar, and then we basically just sold mojitos on a on a rooftop, and it is without a doubt the best business plan I've ever seen. Just say you do mojitos, and that they're the best, and have a rooftop, and you'll be busy. And that's it every day. Yeah, you don't need to do it else. So the rest of it's a fucking lie. Just sell mojitos, mate. It's a dream. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how it all started, and then I went to Australia after that. I went back home to Ireland for a bit, worked in hotels again. Realized I couldn't, I couldn't stay working mm. in hotels, and went to Australia, and I found myself just being treated very, very kindly by the both the industry there and the the people who who kind of ran it. You know, I, I went to work in a place called Saint Crispin in Melbourne. I don't know if you've been yeah. there before. It's like a hatted restaurant on um, Spit Street, and there was a bar upstairs called Thomas Olive. And like I thought, I knew how to bartend and stuff, and I went in there and. You had to go through the, you knock on the door, go through the fucking kitchen, talk to the fucking chefs. And they brought you up the back stairs to this little bar. 
and there was like 12 to 14 seats depending on if they needed them downstairs for the restaurant <laughs> and um <laughs> Uh, I made all the drinks there like nobody else made drinks it was just me and I was there for like two and a half years and it was like fucking awesome so uh, that guy Connor that I was talking about uh, he came over and he started working on the floor there and we just had like two Irish lads way out of their depth in a in a two hat restaurant <laughs> um, so <laughs> who was funny so like so I was going to ask so you were you, were you training under anyone at any stage that kind of actually guided you in this, you know, in, in, in the mixology world of, uh, of everything? Or was it just something that you were, you just kind of self-taught? Uh, self-taught to a certain degree. Self-taught, but like picking up stuff as I was going. Like you'd sit at bars in Melbourne and you would see what people were doing and try and figure out why this place was busy and what flavor and like what's that bottle. I probably was the most annoying fucking dude because I would just ask loads of fucking questions. Yeah. So I, I had another humbling experience at the hands of a, consumer, of a customer. Uh, I was talking about this fucking new mezcal that we got into the bar and I was fucking pumped. It was when uh, Del Maguey Vida had just launched and it was like pre-Perno days. It was like super cool to have Del Maguey. And I was like, yeah, yeah, in Oaxa, this is where they make uh, an agave distillate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This woman just looked at me and she was like, it's pronounced Oaxaca. And I was like, what? <laughs> was like, She's like, the place that you're saying, Oaxa, that's not a place, it's Oaxaca. And I was like, ah. Okay, so Whoops. I then went and did some more study because I just hated not knowing and I hated being made a fool of. Everyone, it's like a human, yeah, it's like a human uh, human response to it, really. Uh, so yeah, I made it very uh, made it my mission not to be as wrong from then on because I just couldn't take the the shame. She was pretty chill about it. Normally, I, like my car, she probably could have went absolutely through me asking more questions. She just like left me alone. She could see I was freaked. <laughs> Funny, I, 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 I'll never forget the, the sensation that the the. the the drop in my stomach when she said it to me. It's just like, oh, fuck, I've been caught out here. That's not good. So, yeah. No. I mean, it wasn't even that. Like, in the grand scheme of things, it's one interaction. It's not a big deal. But it's funny, those things that stick with you. So, I mean, it's, it seems like, you know, you're, you're, you're pretty you're pretty self-motivated to be out there, you know, educating yourself to really kind of progress progress your knowledge and your, and your, um, and your kind of climbing in, in, in the industry. Because you, you went on to – when did you move on and work at uh, Black Pearl? Uh, that was so after St. Crispin and uh, Tom Sullivan, I went to Whiskey and Ailment. And to be honest, I learned a fucking unbelievable amount there because the guys who run that place, like there's a thousand malts on the back bar. Mm -hmm. um, and like walking in and looking at the shelf, I was like, holy fuck, I'm out of my depth here. But the like uh, Brooke and Jules who run it are two of the fucking best humans ever, man. They actually just had a kid. Um, but um, they would, part of their training program was to give you a dram from the back bar every night. So you were like, don't have the same thing twice. Try yeah. and figure out. So like, you'd be surprised how quickly you pick up a knowledge. You know, you go in there and you know you're like 10, that you're like, customers always ask for recommendations. So you're like, yeah, fuck, have you ever tried fucking, I know, this Lafroy quarter cam score. Yeah. Uh, and this Edgewood Hour, you know, you, and you start getting more and more niche and then start to really figure out how the flavors work and how you can appease people. The, the reality being like, you only really sold about 30% of it on a regular basis. And then the rest of it was for uh, super... The super knowledgeable, which Melbourne has. That's the best fucking thing about Australia, man. The customers they just fucking understand and know and are interested. Uh, I would, I would, I would argue that it's the customer base in Europe in general is just not quite as motivated to figure stuff out. Yeah, right. Interesting. Yeah, that's the that, that's the overwhelming sensation or my feeling of. But there's two things in Australia that I always felt. Like, so if you're really good at fucking cleaning glassware in Australia, they'd be like, "You're fucking good at that. Let's see what else you can do." <laughs> Here in Ireland, you clean glasses for the rest of your fucking life. <laughs> so you're like, "Oh, we don't want to replace him. He's doing it right." <laughs> and like that, and then also that customers know know enough, which is really really interesting and kind of humbling. But it it, it, it spurred me on to learn, so I'm so thankful to that to to, to Australia for it um, and Melbourne. Uh, after whiskey and then I went to Black Pearl while I was trying to sort my fucking visa, um, and then ultimately it led to my visa getting pushed back on a technical difficulty, mm. and then I had to wait a year without working after that. And who the fuck could live in Melbourne for a year without working? God. Um, so then I had to come home, basically, to Ireland. And then when we went, I uh, went to Scotland not pretty much straight away after three months working in the industry here. Thinking I was going to save uh, cork bars, I came back to three months and I was like, can't do it, can't do it. Because customers was just, I, I, I sound like I'm bagging out people all the time, but basically I just I, I just found it very demotivating. Um, essentially, I, there was, I can also remember the exact moment where I was like, I've got to get out of here. Mm. I was in the bar and I uh, did agree with these customers at the, door and they're looking at me a bit fucking weirdly and i was like if you guys want to grab a seat i can take an order from you and they're like no no we'll stand at the bar thanks and i was like i mean that's fucking fine and then when i came around 
I was like, uh, what can I get you guys? And your man just said, looked at me and just said beer. And I was like, okay, any particular like fucking color? Like, what is it that you want? There's a fucking 16 taps here, mate. And I just was like, Alan, you shouldn't be doing this. Because like, I was just like, fuck you. And you're like, I know all you want is a beer. And you don't want my fucking shit. But I don't want your shit either. I'm getting out of here. So I went to Edinburgh because to, to uh, continue learning about whiskey. Essentially, I worked in a bar called Devil's Advocate which is another amazing uh, whiskey bar in the heart of Edinburgh. It's like right on. It's like this old school pump house. Like architecture in that city is incredible. Mm. It's what happens when you don't fight the English as, <laughs> as fiercely as we did. Everything is fucking beautiful. We just like, uh, so yeah, good, good for them. And then um, <laughs> basically uh, it's this old pump house that you push water down into the, into the, into the city and they've been renovated to have like a pretty stellar kitchen and uh, oh, wow. whiskey experience. This yeah. is offering there. And it was like fucking high volume for cocktails as well. It's cool. It's cool. Really fucking busy bar. Like that place fucking pumped. Uh, no pun intended. And that was good. And then as a result, we use Edinburgh as a base and go visit all the distilleries. Like visited everyone I could get my hands on. Well, yeah, I mean, let's let's let let's talk about whiskey for a second. Um because I mean, arguably Scotland is probably now seen as like the king of whiskey. But yeah, but it 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 all started in Ireland, right? Mm-hmm. Way way back there's, when. There's, there's an excerpt uh, an excerpt in a book called The Red Book of Ossery, which is actually famously on display in London because they just love looking at things that other people own. Um, they're fucking museums. Um, yeah, let's not get into that. Um, yeah, but it's uh, it's, it's about um, a high king. Uh, drinking too much of this um, druid's brew and um, dying essentially from not the hangover, but just like really shittily rectified booze, I suspect. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Um, so that's 1410 or something, I think. So that's the the first official handwritten mention that we have. And that's an Irish book. So that's why we're kind of, there's all that John Jameson story about him coming over from fucking Scotland and making it here. And Scott's man making Irish whiskey, but like the first ever iteration or, mentioning of 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 a, a whiskey spirit Ishkabaha. um at the time it would have been like distilled with whatever plants and fucking herbs were in the area and, and Ish- there wouldn't be any maturation or anything Ishka, Ishkabaha, it, it means w- water of life right yeah yeah very yeah, indeed um very yeah they're v- v- very poetic oh yeah well we're we're cursed with a with a with a the sense of fucking poetry, a morbid sense of poetry in this country, in this part of the world in general. Water of life. I mean, dude. how I feel today, I was not drinking the fucking water of life last night. Holy <laughs> fuck. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, Ireland kind of let, you know, the, 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 they were the pioneers of whiskey. And mm. there were, I think, I, you know, I was doing some research this week and there was like, you know, over a thousand distilleries way back when. <laughs> Yeah. And yeah. and then gradually, you know, I guess with um, with you know licensing and laws coming into place, you know, a, a lot of those distilleries went away. I mean, they, they must have been very small, kind of you know, in the back, shitty small distilleries. Yeah, absolutely. There's a there's a, a, a style of spirit here called pachi, which is everyone thinks is made from potatoes. Mm-hmm. Um, it's basically like you make whiskey for the want of a better term, like the, the GI of it means you need to have more than one grain, yada, yada, yada. But um, essentially, potching translated means little pot right. a, if from Irish to English. And it was so-called because the English were taxing us on, uh, this just sounds like I'm fucking part of some sort of Republican movement, this fucking conversation. <laughs> but I, I genuinely am not. Um, uh, they were taxing us and we were making it legally because we were using it for bartering and trading, of course, and they couldn't tax that. So yeah. they tried to shut down all these thousand distilleries that you mentioned. But it was called a little pot and pot gene because they would just take the pot stills up and run once the once the English were coming for them. So they were making it in the mountains yeah. and out in the islands and stuff. There's a, a famous story about um, this island off of Ireland where they were making pot gene and like there must have been 30 little pot gene distilleries or guys making it more so on the island. And every time the English came over, there was none to be found and they were like we fucking know what's coming from here but what was happening was the it was the only the irish people who could bring them out in the boats the irish guys were still in the boats and they would be like oh it's too choppy we can't land here so every time a, a boat circumnavigated the whole island they knew there was a tax guy on it <laughs> so in the end they had to put um a police uh like a police warden on the they just stationed them on the island oh, to try okay. and cut down on the 
Yeah, and he was not a popular man. Obviously, I'm sure, I'm sure he wouldn't have been. That's tough, tough, tough gig. Yeah, absolutely. And there's like a, there's like a million stories of these like uh, like the Pochine Wars they called them, where the English came and the Irish were trying to fight back, but yeah, like being able to do it themselves. And then what was it yeah. that because at one stage, at one stage or another, you know the the Ireland being the number one place for whiskey, it, it slowly declined, and then Scotland kind of took over. And yeah, so uh, there's a, a man called Aeneas Coffey, mm-hmm. uh, who a lot of this story kind of centers around. He's the, the guy who's been credited with inventing uh, the column still. Yeah. Now, there was a couple of different iterations floating around at the time. Um, and it's kind of a contentious story, actually, as to who really invented it. But this is the, the, the common uh, the common acceptance is that Aeneas Coffey was very heavily involved. He was actually a tax man uh, working for the English here in Dublin. And he was working in the D8 area, which is where I live, essentially. Uh, in D8, there would have been like 30 distilleries in like a four kilometer radius. And there was a wow. thing called the Golden Triangle, which is John Jameson, uh, Powers, and um, and George Rowe. So there, there was this like little triangle. And within this place called Newmarket, there was 30 distilleries or so. There was like tanneries and breweries, places like just outside city walls and fucking chaos reigned and booze was king. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, there was like brothels and everything. There's all this like real dark history about it. But because it was outside the city walls, there was just the, whoever was the biggest and strongest survived essentially. So um, uh, famously, there was a fire there, actually, quite funny, the Great Fire of Dublin. Um, 11 people died, but not from fire because this, uh, this uh, maturation warehouse went up on, went up. Uh, a light and fucking the whole city nearly blew off the map, of course, because there was so much booze in that area. <laughs> and there was just like booze running through the shit, through the streets, like animals on fire, because th- there's tanneries there. So, like pigs on fire. That flaming pig whiskey you ever see it is like a, a, an ode to that. Uh, okay. Because there would be pigs literally running through the streets on fire. Jeez. And it's where the phrase to fill your boots comes from. So, people were taking their shoes off and scooping up the whiskey that was running through the streets and drinking it. Of course, because it was mixed with all the excrement and all this fucking nasty shit they were using for production they're, they're just dying like basically <laughs> um it's just not a proud day for the nation just not letting people fucking too much booze uh, and it was also the first year that the the fire uh, fire brigade existed in ireland so this guy's like first big fucking job was to try to put the city out and no matter what they did because they were the solvents the the like i'll call the solvent so it just kept like getting thinner but the fire could exist upon it the whole time you know chucking water on it had no effect mm. essentially you're just spreading the fire further they had to go to all of the uh, areas where they were storing the horse manure because it was all horse and cart driven. And they had to build essentially like walls of excrement around uh, the D8 to, <laughs> so the fire could basically burn out on it. Uh, yeah, so pretty intense. Uh, pretty intense fucking first year on the job. I mean, I hope that fucking guy got promoted. Uh, yeah. But why, uh, why, but yeah, why so, was it that, you know, that the, that the Irish kind of, oh, I mean, I wouldn't say like rejected, but weren't a fan of this new still that was invented. Like what, what was it yeah. that was like, you know, we're, we're, we're just going to continue making it the way we have been in these pot stills or, or whatever. And, and then the Scottish were like, no, no, we like to look at this new still. It's, um, what- yeah, I, I guess the obvious joke there is that the Scots enjoy anything that's cheap and cheerful. But like <laughs> the reality was, is that the Irish people just were so like slow, just slow pot still whiskey was what made Dublin whiskey unique and Irish whiskey unique. And they didn't really want to air from that too much. Mm-hmm. A couple of places did take it on, but the reality was, is that the demand for cheap, efficient spirit was, was being met by Scotland. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so, 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 so it actually using that still, it, it, it was quicker, but it was also cheaper. Yeah. So you could, you know, we were, we were using, Barley, mostly, for the most part, um, okay. here in Ireland, the pot still. And there's like, it's a long process because it's, you got to distill it once and you got to redistill it. Um, here in this column still, you just turn the fucking thing on, pump the fucking, the, your mash in, and you just let it go. Like you, there's no, it never stops. It's how you make vodka. I yeah. was in, um, I was in uh, Fife in, in Scotland uh, with Diageo, and we went to see where they made Spearnoff, which is in like this this tiny little door in the Tanqueray distillery where they're like, don't go in there. And they go in, and there's just like 10 fucking massive fucking volume stills. And the man's like, they never stop. They just never stop. Wow. One of them breaks, we speed fucking things up. 
if the demand goes down, we just slow it down a little bit. Those fucking things, they never stop. <laughs> and it's just like the most morbidly gray fucking area in the building. And then you go back out and they're like, look at how shiny the tanker stills are. So <laughs> like, that, that's where you make all the money in there. Yeah. Um, it was very funny. Um, but yeah, so essentially the same time, I suppose, the stocks could just pump booze like, through their column stills and make uh, very cheap, very efficient, and very consistent whiskey, you know. Um, mm-hmm. I suspect... And even it is still is the case, you know, depending on who's working, you're always going to have different levels of interest and different levels of attention to detail. And in a very manual process, like possible distillation a lot of time, and certainly back then, you get people who would be coming in and just being like, yeah, yeah, fuck, I'm just getting this done for the day. So, you know, it wouldn't always be the same cuts, potentially. It was all done by nose and and, and taste. Yeah. Whereas with, with the column stills, you would just be like, we're going to produce X amount it's just, from this. It's just weight. Like it's just completely consistent and anyone can, you know, essentially operate it. And it's just, and that's effectively, it. if you have an engineer that to keep the thing running, yeah, yeah. you're fine. So yeah, um, that's how you produce, you just distill it. To, you still to a very, very high content essentially. So like up in the 96, 97, so there's nothing left of the serial character, you know, mm-hmm. whereas with the pasta whiskey, you'd be, you'd be taking it off a little lower to and try then- and keep some of the flavor. And then when did you when do you think Irish whiskey really made its comeback because it's been the isn't it kind of classified as like the it's been the fastest growing spirit like every year since you know the early yeah. 90s Yeah it's been nice mainly thanks to Jameson oh and also I should have probably add that prohibition really fucked us here in Ireland as well because we've been selling a load of Irish whiskey over there Yeah um and actually yeah, I should I should circle back basically um uh, Prohibition kind of killed us, and the original boom in Irish whiskey was thanks to the Phylloxera virus in, in France. Uh, the grapes oh, in wine. And just yeah, decimated oh. the grapes. So they were looking for what was considered the next the next delicious uh, product of spirit. And Dublin whiskey was the one, particularly Dublin whiskey, like you, you would see on the bottle Dublin whiskey. Yeah. And you could probably sell Dublin whiskey for about 20% more to 30% more than uh, whiskey from Galway or Cork or Belfast or whatever, because it was just seen to have this sort of prestige around it. Uh, but yeah, the the flux virus is kind of what was the tank for the initial rise in, in popularity of Irish whiskey. Um, and I guess the craft behind it as well, you know, they, they could see that these people really fucking cared mm. what they were producing a lot of the time. Um, so yeah, sorry, uh, Jameson, yeah, uh, is the tank for uh, the huge rise in like, like the sales. They're obviously they're losing market share all the time now due to the amount of studies that are available currently. Yeah. For a long time, it was like 90% Jameson sold of all Irish whiskey sales. And then the, uh, like, <laughs> 90% of that was in America. You know what I mean? So like unbeknownst to us, Irish whiskey was becoming a thing in Ireland. Or like unbeknownst to us in Ireland, it was becoming a thing globally. We had yeah. no fucking clue. Because people like uh, Jameson really is like a mixed drink here. Like people will drink Jameson and ginger ale a lot. Yeah. Uh, Jamo and dry, uh, as you would say in Australia. Um, and like uh, the older generation would drink a little a little wedge on the side of their beers or whatever. But the, you know, like Powers and Paddy kind of fill that role as well. And then there's Irish coffees. But beyond that, like, like lads my age growing up, we wouldn't have been drinking and whiskey. That would have been seen as like your, your father's thing or, oh, okay. or uh, something the older generation did. And now it's like immensely popular amongst the youth, like partially due to how much fucking money is being pumped into it. So you just see it everywhere now. Jameson is a lifestyle brand as, well, as much as it is. Uh, it, it's pretty extraordinary because, I mean, if you walk in, you could probably, probably walk into any bar in the entire world and there's going to be a bottle of Jameson behind the bar. Yeah. I think it's like the fourth biggest selling spirit in the world. You know, like in terms of just sheer distribution, like behind Johnny Walker and stuff. But like, I mean, how's how's that brand viewed within Ireland though? Is is it is it still? I mean, because they've got different variations of the of the spirit itself. You know, like yeah. I guess like the basic level moving up to like you know single barrel stuff and all that kind of shit. But how's it uh, how how's it viewed within Ireland compared to? Because I mean. My brother gives me shit for drinking too much Jameson, and I I, I won't lie, I, I I really really like it. It's just it's fucking delicious. It's, it's delicious. Like it, yeah. I can drink it like water, which kind of makes me sound like an alcoholic, but yeah, it is it is just a, it it's delicious. But how's, um, how's how, how's it viewed back home? So it's a good question. Uh, it's viewed like. Favorably, I think throughout the most, of the, there's always like the whiskey elite or the whiskey nerds who are like, 
oh, fuck them, you know. Yeah. They're just trying to cut corners and make cheap booze and whatever. And it's not really the truth. Like, they produce a fantastic spirit. Like, it's super consistent, which is crazy, you know. So, like, making the whiskey taste the same over and over and over. It's really fucking hard because barrels all are fucking different trees. They're all different. It, you know, there's just so much stuff that can that can cause it to taste. Uh, to, to, there's so many variables, essentially, when you're making whiskey that, like, you need to have really talented people on board to make sure it tastes the same the whole time. Mm -hmm. uh, which they do um like the 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 company that owns them Perno Ricard is not really favorably looked upon here in Ireland but like big corporate companies in general are, not, are never favorably looked upon but like the fact that they've kind of come in and um you know try to like modernize loads of things that were what we considered uniquely ours in terms of the whiskey thing and you know they've shut off the actual you can you can go visit like the old Jameson distillery but you can't go see like what the where it's actually being made you know what i mean it's just a real big oh, okay. it's a goliath you know now and like the the people in the whiskey industry kind of feel like it's a it's bullying people essentially you know like this this thing that is irish single pots of the whiskey so like red breast or like oh, milton yeah. which came from them initially this is when you use a mixture of unmalted and malted barley for your fermentation okay um and it, it causes you to get like this sort of like delicious stone fruit sort of flavor a lot of the time and um, like when you, ever anyone talks about Irish whiskey they're going to tell you like oh like orchard fruit like stone fruits and you know uh, like soft and mellow and these fucking things this is inherently what pot style whiskey tastes like with a little bit of spice um, so it's like your catch all <laughs> for Irish whiskey yeah um, and they the Irish Whiskey Association had sort of like written into had asked them what like single pot style whiskey was so they could have on the bottle by law a bit like bottled and bond or bourbon you know they're like ways of protecting the quality of the product mm -hmm. uh, like what the recipe was and they said 50 percent malted and 50 percent unmalted and that became in law single pasta but the reality is if you look through any of the records of all recipes there was all sorts of fucking mash it was like 30 percent unmalted some fucking rye you know um oh, wow. loads of yeah so like really interesting really in like um, innovative is probably uh, a term that gets used way too much nowadays but like really interesting stuff people trying different things essentially what was local to them most likely because that's always how things get created initially um and all of this now was suddenly you couldn't do it anymore it was illegal to do it so there's been huge campaigns by the distilleries here to try and alleviate the restrictions on single pots mainly because having that on your bottle adds a certain value you know what i mean so like why why are they allowed just to do their own why are they the the gold standard when the reality yeah. is it's not the truth so that's that's the the, the big thing at the moment and there was a guy called Fiona O'Connor, who's a, a Irish whiskey author. He has a book called *The Glass Apart*, which is all about single pot still. Mm -hmm. And he did a—he's like did his dissertation on this essentially in college, and did a huge fucking piece. And uh, did sixteen different old school distillates from recipes that he'd found, and then released them all and invited everybody in the industry to come and taste them. You know, anyone with decision making power. Yeah. And um, uh, I actually have a box of them down there. Um, but the the off off the back of it, like Pernod got invited and Jameson and all those guys. And um, off the back of it, it's uh, now re-looking at the, at the laws. So there's a good chance in like, oh, the wow. next year or so, this, going, this thing, restrictions will be lifted and like Irish whiskey is going to sort of boom again, which will be excellent because at the moment, everyone just talks about fucking cask maturation and innovation in that here. We're just now we're like going out and finding any sort of fucking weird wood that we can, <laughs> that we can find them and put whiskey into it because we, we don't have to use just oak barrels here in Ireland. We can use any wood. Oh, okay. Whereas in Scotland, they have to use oak. So like uh, Rowan Cole, who I used to work with, uh, released uh, Japanese sugi wood uh, two days ago, which okay. is the wood that they use for aging sake. Yeah. And like the, the it's actually a super fucking cool innovation, to be honest. Uh, Laura Hemi, who came up with this genius. There's no, there's no law in the, in the uh, regulations about the shape or the size of the bomb that you put in the barrel. Of, so, of the what? Of the bung, of the bung, the UNG. Okay. It's like the cork, the big yeah. stopper. Ah, okay, that you okay. put into the um, so you're not allowed to put wood chips in. You're not allowed to put fucking staves in to try and accelerate maturation. Yeah. They never mentioned the bung. So what what they did, what we did was uh, we put six bungs into the top of the, the barrel and they were shaped like these big fucking spears. <laughs> and so they're, they're, they're sticking into like they're basically it's super fucking bold and it will be changed for sure. But the fact that we got it out and released, so they got it out, I don't want anyone, uh, they got it out and released um, is incredible, you know, because it's like a real, wow. like, this is playing with the rules and I can't get in trouble for it really, but like it will fucking piss people off for sure. <laughs> uh, and that's, 
and then that makes the the whiskey association like oh for fuck's sake we gotta change that law now mm -hmm. it's like in my idea a triumph because uh it just shows you're really trying to do something new and different you know well, and it's delicious most most of all when when was it that that you know you you realized that getting into distilling was 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 the path you wanted to take uh, uh the dream for me has always been since i started to really get into it to have my own brand mm -hmm. be part of the brand at the top level and you know have a distillery and produce a couple of fucking things that are fucking immensely delicious and then like that's fucking it for me i just want to produce some delicious things for the world to have and then just go live a fucking quiet life somewhere i have no dreams of grandeur and making loads of money but like the best bosses I've ever had in my life in the industry have been guys who've done guys and girls who have done the thing that I was doing at the time. Do you know what I mean? So like if a uh, good example, there's a guy called uh, Luke Skidmore who runs Tipo Zero Zero. He's the owner of Tipo in Melbourne, that awesome pasta joint. Yep. And um, he was the, well, fuck me. He wanted to do this anyway, it's fine. Without a doubt, he was the best manager <laughs> uh, I, I ever had because he had this amazing ability just to like, if you had an issue, he would just be like, okay, that's my problem now you go back about your business and continue running service or doing whatever, look after your tables. That table is mine. I don't even want you to look at them anymore. I look after them. Yeah. And he was just alle alleviating the problem, not just being like, oh, go over there and fucking handle it. He would just take all the shit onto himself, basically, uh, and then put out fires for his whole evening a lot of the time. And he, it was amazing because the, the restaurant, as a result, worked really well because there was never really any issue that could, could stop you anymore. Mm -hmm. But you're like, well, if these guys have been fucking assholes, I'm just going to get fucking Luke to deal with it. And, you know, you, you're not that you would just be handing off everything, but like anything that was like stressing you out, he would just remove it from the equation. So there was never an issue. There was never fucking drama about drink service. It's just like, I'm doing that now. Go back about what you're doing. You're like, oh, okay. I can't even be annoyed anymore because this is not the problem, <laughs> uh, which is incredible. But what he'd done was, and he'd be the first person in and you'd be cleaning the toilets. Uh, just having a boss who has done and understands every issue that you have doing your role no matter how small it is it's going to be a person that you want to want to work for and it like builds allegiance you know yeah we would fucking throw ourselves in the traffic for fucking luke because you just knew he had our back all the time um so that's basically why i have got into distilling now because it's the one big part of the industry that i haven't done i've got done bartending i've been a brand ambassador uh, and I'm, you know a lot of marketing was involved in that of course as well i was very lucky to be given a load of insight into how that works with the azure uh, my boss there, Haley Milner, is one of the great humans, uh, and just like probably to boldly showed me all the things that was happening behind the scenes when really I was, like was supposed to just be a brand ambassador going around and was like a fucking hipster and trying to get people to drink yeah. whiskey. Um, but it was cool, you know. And then we did the she like allowed me to be very involved in the building of the distillery here in Dublin in terms of design and the bar. Did the cocktail menu there, um, everything, you know, and. The plan is to have done it all. Now, nowadays, I deal with the, the all the revenue returns for the distillery. I mean, I had no idea how that worked until fucking six months ago. Uh, well, a year ago now. Mm -hmm. And like, this is another thing that I've done. So I can never have someone just come and be like, oh, that's not working because... And they could say some shit to me. I'll be like, well, no, that's not fucking true because I've done that. That's that's not how that works at all. You know what I mean? I and mean, you people can't take advantage of of you or you can empathize the people on a much better level. So that's the, the, the plan has always been to... To have done it all from cleaning the toilet, sorry, to be up to run to own the business. All the way to the top. All the way to the top. I mean, yeah. It's tough, tough at to the top, they say, but it's tougher at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> so talk me through like the actual process of distilling. So if if if, if sure. we go if if we go start to finish, I mean and, and also I mean, you know, becoming becoming a, a head distiller like you are now at, at um at Still Garden. Is it is it just something that we, you know? Can you just do an apprenticeship in a way, learn learn the craft, and just kind of you know make make your tweaks and put your kind of stamp on things? Because, I mean, from the outside looking in, you would think that you know becoming a distiller, there's, you know, is, is there a lot of science behind it? Is there a lot of you know that that world where you know you really have to wrap you know wrap your head around it, and it can become quite difficult. I guess I, I would say, unlike my hospitality training where I'm classically trained, I am extremely uh, untraditional in, in the methods and uh, means that uh, we use at Stillgarden. And, you know, to be honest, like I probably couldn't go into a big uh, distillery and be like, hey, I'm a distiller somewhere else. I can come, can I come work here because what we do there is truly experimental uh, a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And 
we are using the equipment that we have to the best of our ability, but also to the strengths that we possess. So what I kind of mean by that is like, we're so flavor led from our background in hospitality and working at bars and things and, you know, creating drinks that sometimes we use stuff that people would use for something. And an example is that we use like an ultrasonic bath um, that cleans jewelry normally. Yeah. And we use that for like a rapid infusion of flavor and maturation, because when you, when you put two, uh, like a, a liquid in there with something you want to infuse, say fucking mango or whatever, the flavor molecules implode as opposed to explode. And as a result, they cling to each other much faster. Oh, so wow. you get like the effect of like three days infusion in a half an hour. And, you know, did like these sort of things uh, that people wouldn't normally, uh, I guess normally wouldn't be looking at a, a jewelry cleaner and thinking that's all we can do with it. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And like, we don't have uh, like a water bath. So we'll like, we'll, we'll, uh, vac seal, uh, like syrups and put them into the, the dishwasher and put it up to the, the 40 degree temperature and just run the dishwasher with them inside there. Like <laughs> you just got to use what you got, what, what you're given. Um, so, but actually to, to actually answer your question, essentially, like if you look into, well, what spirit are we making? Are we going to make whiskey for this? Yeah. Analogy? Yeah. We're making whiskey. Making whiskey. Um, you, you want to source like the best quality grain initially that you want for single malt you're going to have to use barley so we'll get our barley uh that goes that runs in a number of different grades there's like cattle feed beer uh barley and all the way up to like this real heritage grains and stuff um you grab that uh and then you basically want to germinate you want to trick it into thinking that it's still alive once you have it harvested Mm -hmm. and what that causes is similar with agave it it uses this it starts to produce sugar to to get energy so it can start to sprout and then basically with all the sugar present on the grain you kill it again this is called malting mm-hmm. um and then you have basically a whole lot of like very sweet barley is ideal because we're turning that sugar into alcohol that's the very base premise of it all you want sugar you turn it into alcohol uh, so like you add it to some warm water and then you have like this kind of power g thing called wort and then the water like rips all the all the sugars off the grain, and then that gets separated from the barley, and the barley goes down and then it shoots, and you can go feed the pigs or whatever. Um, so it's a nice cyclical sort of nature there because it's still full of nutrients and stuff. Um, okay. So once you have your word, like it'll be like super low ABV. It'll be like fuck, I don't know, low, low. Um, um, and then you just add yeast to it, essentially. So you want the yeast to eat the sugar and convert it into alcohol. Yeah. Um, this is the same like same process as making beer, um, and now like, traditionally you would use a thing called turbo yeast, which is just like, really fucking efficient, just like very aggressively add sugar and then turned it into alcohol. But nowadays people are experimenting, just like with tanks, tanks. I'd say mostly in, uh, to beer culture, um, to see what other flavors they can they can they can get from uh, these these different yeasts and different styles. Um, the like, famously one of those guys uh, will. Rogue Brew. Which one? Dead Rogue. Dead Rogue. Is that what they're called? They had like that beard beer where they extracted yeast from their brewer's beard and put it into the fucking, <laughs> into the, into the mash, into the fermentation. Um, which is pretty, <laughs> like you can, yeast is everywhere, you know what I mean? So like, yeah, it's a, it's a like, gross sentence. Uh, yeast is everywhere, guys. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so you, like, you're not really, there's so many steps along the way of the journey like, that impact flavor when everyone thinks like a lot of times it's, through the still but even before we've even at this point where we've picked our cereal and then we have added yeast you know we have we've already had two two choices to make on on, on what sort of flavor we're going to be we're going to be taking um so once you allow it for ferment you want to bring it up to about eight percent essentially uh, and it'll start to taste a little bit like a hefeweizen or uh, like a whole garden you know these sort of, these oh, sort yeah. of um these sort of kind of soury sort of germanic beers um, it'll end up tasting a little like that because you, this is the point where you would add hops in beer normally. Got and it. Okay. With, with whiskey distillation, we don't do the hops and we just put it through the stills. So the stills are essentially giant kettles. And all you're trying to do is boil the alcohol out of it, for the want of a better term. So uh, alcohol uh, evaporates 86.5 degrees and water boils at 100. Mm-hmm. So that's the method that we use. So essentially we, we bring it up slowly in temperature to about 86, 87. 
and then you're going to get the alcohol separating from the from the water and then you just do that process over and over and over and um, runs up through the to the copper pots this copper is an amazing um like cleanser um essentially if you have any like copper stuff in your house and you put your finger inside nearly always you'll have like a little black smudge on your hand afterwards mm-hmm. like what the fuck is this that's because the, the copper is purifying the air and it's ripping out the nasty shit that's in it it's an amazing amazing property material anyway the same the same sort of premise exists when the vapors are going up through the copper still so touching the copper and they're being purified or rectified um and sorry my cat's about to fucking do something really bold would you fucking stop um uh, it's um Essentially, it goes up to the column still, or up to the column in, in this still. Uh, and it, there's a, often you'll see like these big bulbs in the middle of the still. Yep. These are called reflux bulbs, and it causes the vapors to kind of do like whirlpool motion. So it gets like low to contact with the copper. And then only the really light esters or flavored compounds can make it up to the very top of the neck. And then they go through basically like a condensing coil. So there's a, a weak coil, and there's just cold water surrounding it. It turns it back into liquid. And, Bang, you have uh, you make spirit. You need to take cuts um, from the, from this um, process because the, the nasty shit really begins at the start. So it's called the heads, the hearts, and the tails. Yeah. Um, and you need to take a decent cut at the start. Otherwise, like this is where all the stories about going blind from drinking too much whiskey and stuff. You're like, just drinking fucking poison, basically. Um, <laughs> so you need that cut. And then the heart bit will be the best tasting quality and then it starts to get like really oily and sort of viscous and a bit fucking sulfury towards the end then and, like you can always tell when you're approaching the tails because you get like this wet dog cardboard smell and okay. you're like i do not want this in my product so you've got to be very careful uh, when you're doing that and, uh, but particularly initially because after a while you can get a consistent process and you you will know at like oh when it's 89 percent, we start to switch over uh, to our hearts cut or when it gets to 75 or whatever, it starts to get a bit fucking nasty, you know? Uh, you But you build this up through repetition. But the initial mm-hmm. the initial distillation is the commissioning of your still and your distillery it takes quite a while uh, to get your head around uh, what's good and what's not. And um, so um, like at Still Garden, we, everything is super manual. So like I would basically take, we don't have like a, a beautiful spirit safe box. Like I'm running a hose off the still that yeah. I put into buckets. And you know, it's just constantly tasting like all day. Yeah. Make sure that the product the quality of the product is good. Can, it's really, it's like r- really good learning. Can Can you do anything? So w- w- with those cuts that you're talking about, that you have to kind of take away from you know your your, your main um yeah your main kind of liquid. Can, can you do anything with that, or is it just is it just thrown out? A, a lot of distilleries, because uh, there's still good alcohol left inside there, it just hasn't had the chance to to make it up. We'll put it back into the pot still for the next run. If you know oh, okay. what I mean? Um, because you will basically just rip out good what's what didn't have chance to get out the last time. Okay. Um, and it's uh, just a good way to go about doing it, basically. And it's like you, you wouldn't ever really put booze in. At, you know, it kind of fortifies the the booze that's going in there as well because it brings up just brings up the ADV a little higher. Like putting in eight percent booze takes a long time to get that eight percent up to eighty because there's loads of redistillations essentially. Mm. I don't know if I'm being very clear. No, I, I think I think that was pretty clear. It was, it was okay. clear, clear and thorough. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's very kind of you. It's very generous of you. Um, yeah, and then uh, the next step there would be filling barrels. So you would go source barrels. Traditionally, it's American on American ex bourbon barrels mm-hmm. because I'm, I suspect, as you know, like in America, you can only use uh, American oak cask once and still call the product bourbon. So they need to get rid of them. Yep. Um, so a huge amount of the trade here in Scotland Ireland is based off the fact that those laws exist in bourbon. And if that change that people like Jim Beam and those keep pushing for to remove this requirement, it would fucking cripple the industry here. Wow. I suspect because uh, it, the, the price of a sherry cask is about a thousand, a thousand euro. Jeez. If you want like a, a refill bourbon barrel, it's somewhere between 50 and 150, depending on the quality of the thing. And the, and and the barrels that you're using, you, you can just use them over and over, right? Um, they get so the barrels start to become tired. It's kind of okay. how we call it. Yeah. Um, the the vanillins that are in the wood is what we're we're trying to extract to mm-hmm. create this sort of uh, rich rich flavor. Uh, vanillins are like plants' ways of protecting themselves from bugs. 
Okay. So when they eat the eat, eat the sap, it's so bitter that they fuck off and leave the tree to live. Um, but when you put spirit in there, it's just, it just gives this like delicious vanilla esque uh, flavor. Yeah. It's kind of funny because if you ever like eat, eat vanilla essence when you're a kid, you're thinking that's going to be like the most delicious fucking thing in your life. <laughs> a bottle of vanilla essence is fucking perfect. Get that in me. And it's like astringent and fucking bitter. It's fucking horrible. And uh, it's essentially the stuff that's in the wood um, that you're trying to extract into your whiskey. And also it gives it the color as well. I mean, color could be modified in a number of ways. Like I could. You know, it's easy to, to add color to things nowadays, essentially mm-hmm. through like uh, E1, E150, which is essentially like distillers caramel. So it's a caramel color. doesn't yeah. really do it into the flavor. Anyone who tells me that they can taste the caramel in the fucking whiskey, I know for sure it's full of shit because <laughs> the amount that you need is like 0.001%. And you're doing a batch in the bigger distilleries where they would do it for consistency sake. Like the batches are like multiple hundreds of thousands of liters you know what i mean i'm like you can't fucking taste this thing it's impossible um and yeah uh, yeah like i i get why people get upset about it because it's like technically changing the the end product to a certain extent but consistency amongst you know like the core the core expressions in the brand like if every bottle of jameson was a different color would be poured it you would just be like what the fuck is going on here and 100 yeah. percent, it's always different when they make it because trees and wood all have different interactions and you're using like fuck me i don't even know what like a blending session for, for jameson looks like but they probably disgorge six thousand bar- barrels you know what i mean mm. like what the fuck how are you gonna get that to be the same as the last time we did it but you know people just don't have any any uh, perception of how how difficult it is really and to be fair i was the same when i was young man i was like oh i don't drink uh i don't drink whiskey with caramel coloring in it you know uh, it uh, ruins it, uh, and then like every day, like, I go see it get done, and I'm like, God, I was a fucking asshole. Because um, it's like, dude, it's such a small amount, it's so funny. And the human ability to perceive flavor is not that fucking good. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's been eye opening seeing, and this is uh, again kind of back to why I want to do all of it because I don't want to be the guy who's like, oh, I'm a fucking brand, we don't use caramel coloring because X. I want to be like, we don't use caramel coloring because we don't need it because we want to show people how it looks yeah. and the process. It's not because it's bad or that's the flavor. And it's a much more real message to tell people, you know? And if you're trying to build brand allegiance with people uh, to come and drink your fucking expensive as fuck whiskey, you, you need to be straight with them and honest. And that's something that, you know, I'm being very fortunate to see the inner workings of it all now. And as a result, try and pass on the honesty as much as I can. And how's, how's the local industry, you know, been growing over the last few years in terms of, New, new distilleries opening up because I mean cr- it seems like craft spirits all over the world has just exploded um, yeah it's gone crazy uh, 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 Dublin in general now has four distilleries back in that golden triangle I was talking to you about yep. there's four distilleries in there again um, I mean we have a ways to go before we get to 30 but um, Rowan Co is there Teeling is there Teeling who are kind of responsible for really kicking off the craft movement here in Ireland again which is oh, okay. amazing yeah um pierce lions is there which is very small in this old church beautiful uh beautiful beautiful uh, distillery probably the, like the best looking stills in the world because they have this beautiful copper stills with the stained glass window of the whiskey making process behind it it's like <laughs> wow. fucking amazing to see um and then there is dublin liberty distillery as well the guys who make dead rabbits whiskey uh they make yep. Dublin and, and uh liberty stuff so uh amazing to be like back in ireland during the 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 revision of the, like the boom is back essentially like you said earlier and it's cool that we're here like what 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 we do and the whiskey we make and the decisions that are made by the people in the industry now will go down in history because just like this thing i was saying about the legislation getting changed for the postal recipe like that will have a, a huge lasting effect on how the industry looks in mm-hmm. 120 years from now when people walk up thomas street and they look at the Rowan coal building like that's something that i had a huge hand in and it's kind of pretty fucking exciting to know that like we're building a foundation for uh, like a huge trade in the future and it's not just in dublin that all the great whiskey gets made to be fair there's some small distilleries that are just producing unbelievable quality spirits this guy uh in county down called uh brendan cardi who works for a company called uh, or owns a company called kilowin and he's this like single cask high abv weird maturation come taste it 500 ml bottles this is cool shit yeah. Like super heavily peated fucking pot jeans, you know, doesn't give a fuck what you think he's making it. Uh, it's so good. He made a rum recently, which is like this big, nasty fucking funky thing. 
and just and like on a tiny little still and up a fucking mountain and he's just a fucking legend you know and australia has it's kind of funny because the australia australian whiskey scene and the irish whiskey scene sort of mirrored each other a little bit okay even though we had a, a huge industry before we were basically down to fuck all down to three in 1987 there was only three distilleries in Ireland, you know yeah and the with the with the rise and rise of it again you have everyone giving it a go like in tasmania you can throw a stone and you're going to hit someone making whiskey like yeah um and it's incredible like the characters that come out of it, like peter belgrove um who has a uh, whiskey you know and he's like, like smoking whiskey uh, smoking malt with like fucking sheep excrement you know what i mean like doing mad shit in really interesting ways he like has a tumble dryer that he's converted into a into a malt and to a malting unit so basically that's how he dries the barley in this old fucking tumble dryer that's a genius look uh he's a, a incredible incredible man he uh he had uh this huge problem he used to grow strawberries uh, that was his that was his previous uh, life um and he was getting these fucking flies were coming in and eating all the all the strawberries on constantly so what he did was he was getting tear gas and gassing the fucking strawberries because it was like not harmful mm-hmm. in the long run and it was killing off all the, the stuff that was eating his uh, eating his fruit stocks and the police were like you can't just be fucking tear gassing <laughs> out here in the fucking country it's gonna fucking hurt somebody so he's like, oh, okay. Um, and then his answer, his solution to that was he made, he planted a load of rye crops and rye grows up real straight and narrow and it stopped the wind blowing through the strawberries and on the wind, flies are coming. Okay. So and then he kind of looked at all this rye and he was like, oh, I wonder what I'll do with all this fucking stuff. So he was like, fuck it, I'm just going to make some whiskey. And like, just did it. And now he's like, he's like a super famous guy, to be honest. And he's been, the uh, Scott Small Whiskey Society went out to Australia to see what was going on and Starward and Tasmania were the two big places they were going to visit. Yep. And of course they met Dave Vitale and like, this is interesting, you know, they had the, the, the that was when um, Starward was in the old airport hangar and it was painted all black up by the airport there because you're getting like really hot and really cold days as a result of maturation was fucking crazy as a result of that um, because wood expands and contracts based on temperature. So basically you have like, the casks breathing for the want of a better term uh, mm-hmm. and having a much more significant impact on flavor uh, but they went and they were like oh, we got to take you to see Pete so they bring him to Pete in, uh, in Tasmania and they were just like what the fuck is happening out here and it was like the, he was he was on the front page of that uh, on, on the cover of it like whiskey how whiskey should be made and it was just a guy who was just doing it off his own back never really asked for much from people just kept doing his own thing and it's an incredible story uh, amazing man, dragged me onto the table once. We were at um, uh, what do you call that fucking day in Melbourne where everyone just gets absolutely fucking loose on booze? It's like a Melbourne whiskey show or Melbourne spirits show, or whatever it is. Okay, I can't remember what it was called. And I was working for Tullamore Jew there because Irish. <laughs> they were like, get that fucking ginger guy who works in. in the... yeah. And uh, and then I met him, and he was he was charring barrels. He had like a big fucking blowtorch, and he was just like showing people how charring barrels works because you, you kind of do that to like wake the wood up again once it starts to get a little tired mm-hmm. like you strip all the, the bad the, all the tired shit out and then kind of open up the pores of it again and uh he was doing that all day we met and then we went to bad frankie obviously famously bad frankie where the home of uh aussie spirits lives and uh we met and said he introduced us and um uh, we ended up going drinking and went to the black pearl and I swear to God, the man has put away so much fucking booze and didn't change one iota. I like fucking stumbled home and I had to get up the next day and I was dreading it. Like when I arrived like, half an hour late, I was this fucking nightmare. And then he was just out like charring more casks, his head inside the fucking flames. Like, how the fuck? He's just like, they'll cut from a different cloth. You know what I mean? Like, oh, well, fuck me. Our generation is soft. Man. <laughs> it's just, like they're a nurse man. And then the course, he's like, how are you feeling? I was like, yeah, 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 good. Good, good, good. Yeah, but not a bother. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, but it's cool to see these like uh, uh, Brendan Carty is a little like or or Peter Milgram, I, w- I would say he's a, a character and amazing at my does it because he loves it you know and it's it's really it's really good to see that because it just means that the future is going to be bright always because if you have people who are in it just to be making lots of money the 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 thirst for innovation and the the, the desire to see things grow well and be new and exciting mm. kind of kind of dims and like. I don't really have any ill feelings towards working for Diageo or for a corporate company, but like the truth of the matter is there like 99% of the people who work for that company don't give a fuck what the product tastes like at the end of the day. It's the people who make it who love it, you know? Yeah. And you go in and there's this, but it's just these people, it's like, I'm an accountant. I don't drink whiskey. 
I am in charge of X. You know what I mean? And you're like, and then you're trying to appeal to them to the fucking the side of passion. They're like, this is not about passion. This is about money. And at the end of the day, that's not something that I could ever really get behind. Um, but it's good to see how it works, you know. Well, um, I'm excited to see what uh, what the future is going to bring from uh, your distilling skills and passion. Yeah. But this is we have we have some whiskey laid down at the moment. It's years years away before it becomes a product, but yeah, we have whiskey laid down in um, Hungarian Tokai bottles or barrels, sorry, and um, some port pipes. Oh wow, which is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, we're just gone for like madness, basically. <laughs> <laughs> we just chose them the path of chaos, like everything else we always do. And like the Tokai has the main, you know, uh, like a dessert wine from Hungary. It's um it's so delicious mm. and like. Sort of savory and real flavors, so so hope, hope, hoping it will have an amazing effect on the on the whiskey. And in the meantime, we're like Ireland's only Amaro producer, so just randomly making Amaro. Oh, really? Uh, and like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we just decided to go after like the fucking hardest category in the world to break. Oh, we're just gonna chase Campari, Napero. Why not? We were. Um, <laughs> I had I, I had a good conversation about Amaro on our, on on the last episode of the Dish Pig, so I'll be interested to uh, taste the the only Amaro in, yeah. in Ireland. I need to send. Uh, yeah, just come visit. I want to send something because sending stuff at the moment is a nightmare. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll come visit. I'll come visit. Bring Jim. All right, Alan. Well, this has been educational, which is the w- 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 one of the key things that the the dish pig's all about. So I appreciate your time and I appreciate mm-hmm. you uh, sharing your knowledge and and I look forward to visiting I mean, visiting you soon. I feel like it was a, a good a good betrayal betrayal of how scattered my fucking brain is. <laughs> You were very, very good at like keeping me in check. Like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. But what about the actual question that I asked? <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah. Um...